Welcome to the Nature Here TV show. Today's show is on Bird 911 with the Portland Audubon Society Wildlife Center. And our guest speaker today is John Rakestraw. Welcome, John. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, just real quick, I would like to mention the Wildlife Care Center's address is 5151 Northwest Cornell Road, Portland, Oregon 97210. They do have a hotline that you can reach them at, 503 292-0304 and a website audubonportland.org. So John, I'd like to know first of all the mission on the Audubon Society Wildlife Care Center. The Wildlife Care Center is actually an animal hospital. It's a licensed wildlife rehabilitation center. So they are licensed and trained to help injured and orphaned wildlife and hopefully return them to the wild whenever possible. Okay, and is it a place that people can come and visit? And is it open to the public all the time if it is? Um, during business hours, you can go visit the center. You don't have access to the animals. They like to keep them as isolated as possible so they don't become acclimated to people. But um, you can see into the facility through windows and they have several birds of prey there that are permanent residents there that you can see. Okay, and how many, do they have like quite a few of them that you can see that are There are about residents? half a dozen resident birds of prey that you can see at any time. Oh, that's great. And is it a great place to bring like children or families or is it easy great to access? Great place for kids, yes. Um, you, can, you can see well. Now from the outside, you have, let's say, large windows into the center. Great place for kids to get close to the animals, um, to the per permanent residents anyway. And um, you can sometimes peek in on operations when um, there's something going, going on. on. Right. Oh, that's great. That would be a fun thing to watch. Um, if someone were to have an injured bird or something that they weren't sure about or they've seen something, then would you definitely recommend calling the Audubon Society? Definitely call first. Um, if you have a, like a small bird that's injured and you can safely transport them in a paper bag, something like that, do so. Um, otherwise, give them a call first. And especially if you're not sure how to handle an animal that might be dangerous, definitely call first. Then they can help you with that. Right. And they would be able to give you that advice over the phone? Generally, so yes. Is, it how, is the hotline on all the time? Or are there certain hours that it's open? They're open during business hours. Um, they do have a message line. So um, Hopefully you can uh, reach them during business hours and, uh, and deal with not. them then. Yeah. Okay, so if you find an animal or some or a bird on the side of the road or something like that, to call first before you always try to call first. Transport them. Right. Okay, and the Audubon Society, how far in uh, an average time to get there if you're from Portland or from the outskirts areas? Um, far from downtown Portland, 10-15 minutes, uh, just out on Cornell Road. Okay, so. and there's quite a bit of land out there. How much, you know how much acreage they're sitting on? Um, I don't. It's several hundred acres just in the Portland Center, and then they're adjacent to Forest Park, which is, of course, about 5,000 acres. So. Right, and people can walk through there. There are hiking trails hiking to the trails center, right. Things. Great. Okay, and with the Audubon Society, how I know that it's a nonprofit organization, so clearly they're funded by public funds. How often do they do they do like any fundraising or anything for it, or is it anything that the Audubon Society, or is it just strictly from the public that helps them out? Um, they do an annual fundraiser called the Birdathon, where mm -hmm. um, you can sponsor teams and people go out looking for as many birds as possible and collect pledges. Um, but they can always use volunteer help. They can use um, supplies, whatever you can. Offer. So people can donate things. For certainly, the... certainly. Okay, great. We're going to watch a video that's got Tracy Campbell on it, and she is. A main worker at the Audubon Society? She's, or she's the director of the Wildlife Care Center. So okay. she, she's the hub. Okay, so she's the main person that knows everything right. about anything when it comes to That's the right. Wildlife Care Center. All right. Great. Okay. This is the Wildlife Care Center um, at the Audubon Society of Portland. Um, its goals are to rehabilitate injured and orphaned native wildlife and get them back into the wild. Um, at the same time, educating people about the importance of the natural world and also their place in it. So, kind of our, our motto has kind of always been, you know, we'll fix, we'll fix the animal, but now you go back and fix the reason why it came in here in the first place. We do have to care for our, this environment because it is our environment also. And we act as a community with all the animals in the environment and we need to help all the animals in our environment to keep our land strong and healthy. So the Audubon Society of Portland is really unique in that we have an actual um, storefront. Most Audubons across the country don't have um, actual places to go visit the Audubon. Um, they're just kind of entities, um, membership clubs, things like that. 
So um, with the Audubon Society of Portland, you can come here, we have trails, um, we have educational animals that you can take a look at. Um, you can look in on the hospital, watch us do procedures. Um, there's no tours necessarily through the care center, except for one day a year we do have um, a care center open house where people can take tours through the care center and see what kind of our day-to-day -day operations like. Um, but yeah, we just have a lot of really nice trails, some interpretive areas, um, and classes for both adults and children. I started um, working with animals when I was 14 years old. I started volunteering at um, a local aviary in Utah, the Tracy Aviary and um, just started volunteering in the bird show department and got really interested in birds. And before, I, I thought birds were the most boring things ever. <laughs> and, you know, after a couple of weeks volunteering there, I just realized how amazing that they were. And, um, you know, I feel like underappreciated in some ways. And so I just became, you know, engrossed by these animals and got an internship when I was 16 and then another one when I was 17 actually doing bird shows and then it just kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Nolan, and I, I think this place is great because you get to see all the wildlife and how like they do, like what they do in the hospital, and you get to see like different animals that are all around. It's really fun. The care center, um, is currently looking into the possibility of opening another care center. Um, so we receive over 3,000 animals a year, over 15,000 phone calls, um, and so we've grown a little bit since our first um, building was built, and the way that our um, um, grounds are set up, we don't, there's not a lot of option for expansion. So um, what we're looking into is seeing if we can actually build a new care center off-site. Um, right now we're looking into the feasibility, but we still need um, board approval to go on and see if that's really something that we're going to do. Every time an animal comes in, um, we do a thorough exam. Um, so we had already done a thorough exam on this owl. Um, every single raptor that comes in we get blood on them. So um, we want to run some uh, lead testing. Uh, we just got a grant that earlier this year to lead test every single raptor that comes in. So um, we get a blood sample for that. Um, we also give it fluids because it seemed pretty dehydrated. It had lost some blood. So we wanted to get um, fluids back into them, get a little bit more stable. Um, and then we put them in an incubator to um, stabilize them. So. That's what we were doing just there, is getting, getting blood, giving fluids, and then um, getting the bird where it needs to go to hopefully recover. The injury was a little difficult to really say. So um, there weren't really any external injuries. Um, it did have a broken nail on one of its feet, uh, and it did have some blood in its mouth, so that kind of um, makes me think that it's more internal injuries. Um, the bird was found at the airport just off the runway. So, um, might have been hit by an airplane. It's good enough for what I need. Got it? Okay. The bird, um, it wasn't unconscious, but it was really dull. So kind of how you saw it just now, just not really responsive. Um, it was like that. In owls, that can mean either that they're not doing well or it could mean that they're doing fine. They're just really stoic about everything. So, um, yeah, it's hard to tell. But the bird was just found down, not really flying very well um, on the side of the runway. So, more alcohol swabs. Now I'm just going to give them fluids. So, I'd say the um, prognosis at this time is pretty guarded um, just because we don't know what other internal injuries are going on. The future treatment that's gonna happen, I guess the, um, the treatment schedule that we're gonna start on is um, we'll ha give the fluids this morning and we'll monitor him in the incubator and see if he um, gets more alert. Um, if he's more alert by this evening, then we'll start offering food. If not, then we'll give more fluids 
Um, but part of the problem with giving too many fluids is that if there is some head injury, some swelling, that that could actually make it worse. Or if there's internal bleeding, that could make it worse as well. So we have to kind of weigh that with how the animal looks this evening. Um, we're also going to be giving it an x-ray later um, just to see that there is any um, broken bones that we didn't initially find on our exam. Um, we also do x-rays on all the raptors to see if they've been shot so, or if there's any heavy metal inside of them. As, as far as surgeries go, we don't do a lot of invasive surgeries here. We don't have the aseptic conditions to do it in here. Um, we're currently looking into getting a new care center and so that um, we'd actually have a surgery suite in there where we could do more invasive surgeries. But as it stands right now, pretty much the only surgeries that we can do are what, what are called like dirty surgeries. So um, if there's a crop rupture, we can do that pretty easily. If it's just putting a couple sutures in, you know, stapling, you know, that sort of thing that we can do um, where there's not going to be a, a lot of chance of really bad infection. If they get injured too much, then they could become an endangered species. Uh -huh. And if they're extinct, it would affect the environment the and oh. like the nature. Mm -hmm. It would it would affect oh, the food chain and the environment and everything yeah. like that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Most of our patients are birds. Um, I'd say the majority of them are, but um, we're not just birds. So we do take care of all native wildlife. So that means um, mammals, um, amphibians, reptiles. Um, yeah, we take care of a lot of different things. I just find it very interesting with all the birds here and how this is the only place I've actually been able to get this up close to a bird before, so. The Wildlife Care Center is um, really unique in that um, the Audubon Society of Portland has been essentially doing rehab since its inception. So um, the caretaker of the, these grounds, his wife would take in injured and orphaned um, birds back before rehab was even a term. Um, so it has a long history based in this organization. Um, and there is also a need for it um, in the Portland metro area because we do have um, such a diverse um, urban wildlife population. I'm Gary Wilson. I live in southeast Portland and found a pigeon, which turned out to be a non-indigenous pigeon in our backyard, wounded. And so I brought it in and uh, unfortunately have to euthanize it because it is not indigenous to this area. I think the hardest part of my job is, is euthanizing animals. Um, it's, it's very much a necessary part. Um, not everything's gonna be able to live, um, you know, and it shouldn't necessarily live. There are certain, certain quality of life considerations that we make every time that we euthanize an animal. Um, and it's really difficult, but sometimes you know, it's, it's very necessary and it is a form of treatment. If an animal is suffering, you really want to help them out of that suffering. Um, and so it's difficult because, you know, you can never get too attached to the animals, but you still need to be attached enough to care for their individual needs and do what's best for them. So, um, you know, you don't want this cold unattachment and just, you know, do everything calculated by the book because it, it really takes away the compassion in the job. Um, that being said, you know, you also don't want to over, um, over invest in something because your emotions can cause you um, not to make decisions that need to, that need to be made. So it's, it's very much a fine line between, you know, being invested but not being overly invested. Will you put in this plate? Right. Yeah, yeah. We have um, we use the same stuff they use on dogs and cats, so it's humane euthanasia. They just fall asleep. The pigeon apparently was wounded, and we suspect by a cat in the neighborhood. For a couple of days, I attempted to nurse the pigeon back to health with what I had available to me, and. That was unsuccessful, and I called the 
wildlife care center here and they suggested that I bring the pigeon in and they would humanely euthanize it. Uh, I have not had this experience before and they were able to kind of guide me through the steps in the process. This was a unique one for me. The, the main policy of the care center is that we treat injured and orphaned native species. So that means that um, we don't treat invasive species. So um, certain types would be like the house sparrow, um, the starling, eastern gray squirrels, eastern fox squirrels, possums, etc. Um, Red-eared sliders also fall into that. Um, we also don't take care of domestic, so you know we're not going to have dogs and cats here necessarily. Um, but we we take care of native wildlife if they need to be here. So if it's a um, if it's a baby bird that somebody's afraid that the cats in the area are going to attack it, we won't treat that because its parents are still around and feeding it. So if it's if it's not injured and if it's not orphaned, it needs to stay out in the natural world. Well, my cat, she injures birds, <laughs> basically, but I've never seen, my dad caught, um, got a bird and helped it once, but I've never really seen a bird getting hurt, basically. One time my cat hurt a bird and my dad um, made the cat go away and then he put the cur the bird and some um, water and some bird food and he, he let it sit overnight because his leg was hurt and then in the morning he he um, had it in this little box and then he let it out and it hopped right out and flew right out of the house. Oh, so you were happy? Yeah, we were happy about that. Good. I'm the operations manager so I have to deal with the day-to-day um, dealing so um, we have over a hundred volunteers every week so it's getting all the volunteers um, set up ready to do their jobs it's training all of them to do it um, it's doing exams it's making sure that we have enough mice it's you know so um, a lot of the job is is very much like a, a volunteer management and also exams and hands-on treatment Pretty good. Is that eye? So with this Swainson's Rush, um, we could tell that there was some paralysis in the legs. Um, sometimes that'll happen with window strikes. Um, usually you can tell within the first 24 to 48 hours if it's going to get better. Um, if it does get better, then we do continue treatment. If it doesn't get any better, if there's no improvement, then we do make the decision to euthanize um, just because, you know, prolonging treatment isn't doing any favors, so. Okay. Alright. Okay. Okay. That was a Swainson's thrush. Um, we have been getting a lot of birds in, a, a lot of Swainson's thrushes in right now. It is migration season for them, um, and a lot of them hit windows. So that's pretty much the main reason why we're getting these swings and stretches in right now. Um, sometimes they just need a couple hours to recuperate and then they can fly off again. It's just kind of the same thing as getting a concussion. Um, sometimes there's more internal injuries so um, we have to keep them. Sometimes there's paralysis, um, some swelling, and um, we kind of monitor that. I'm sorry about like the injured birds and how you know, how it feels, of how it hurts, you know. Quickly, um, that red sunny looks to me like berries. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes these birds will eat fermented berries and then get drunk also. Um, we see it more with cedar wax wings, but it is definitely a possibility if they're eating similar fruit. So, um, yeah, I think it's really good. <laughs> I think it can go back. Okay. <laughs> it looks really good, really alert, um, and I couldn't see any bleeding, so I checked all the bones and
All right? All right. Okay, let me go grab it for you. So I would just wait until you get to the spot um, away from um, like windows and, and buildings and stuff like that. It's still in the area. In the area, area. just not into a window. <laughs> We are a private nonprofit organization. Um, so our funding comes from donations, um, bequests, um, memberships, and um, various uh, schools and camps and things like that that we do charge for. My title is Operations Manager so of the Wildlife Care Center. So um, what I do is I oversee the day-to-day -day operations, um, uh, train volunteers. We have over 120 volunteers um, that come in every week to volunteer here. So um, keeping them current on their training is also um, a lot of the responsibility. Also making sure that we have supplies and answering um, wildlife related inquiries and, and things like that. We have a number of resident educational animals, so um, we have educational birds and then we also have an educational turtle. Um, their stories are pretty varied as far as the reasons why they came in here. Um, kind of a common theme though is, um, you know, it's, it's all man-made reasons. So we have a number of human imprints, so people thought that they were either doing a great thing by taking this animal, raising it, and then releasing it back into the wild, or taking it in thinking that they'd make a great pet, which is illegal and a very bad idea. Um, and so they're here because they can't be released back into the wild because they think that they're people, um, and they could pose a hazard to themselves and to people in, in some circumstances. So we have imprints, um, we have um, a bird that was hit by a car, um, we have another, our turtle came in because it was confiscated from a pet shop. Um, it's illegal to sell or own native species. And so um, with the Western Painted Turtle, um, their numbers are also in decline across the state of Oregon. So it's, um, the turtle wouldn't have been able to be released back into the wild because since it was in the pet store, it might have um, come in contact with potentially exotic diseases. And so if we, if the turtle isn't exhibiting any signs, that doesn't necessarily mean that it, it's not infected. So we wouldn't want to release the turtle and potentially infect the whole population with a disease that they're not equipped to deal with. Special thanks to Lacey Campbell for really doing a great job in the facility. She clearly has a huge job and does a ton of work and has just really been a blessing, I would say, to nature and everything that it has to offer. Yeah, they do great work there and it's a great resource for the Portland area. Yeah, it's incredible. I have been there myself personally. Um, we, had, we were driving out and had run across a bird. We didn't hit the bird, but we had seen it on the side of the road and my children insisted that I pick it up and take it to the Audubon Society not realizing how I should transfer everything, I just wrapped it up in a sweatshirt and thought that it would be fine because it seemed to be asleep when we had taken it to the beginning. Mm -hmm. And halfway to the facility, it came to life and it was very angry at me and yelling and very large that I didn't realize it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And it was a little bit traumatic getting it there, but we got it there and they did the best they could to, you know, to take care of it. And it mm -hmm. was neat to see the kids, to, be able to see them interact with it right. and be able to try to help the bird the best they could. And then just the facility itself, we hadn't been there before. Um, it was just, it was an interesting trip. but. If I had known that, you know, to a brown paper bag is, you know, something, you know, for a bird that's been injured or something like when a bird hits the window, you were saying? Yes, um, you get a lot of window strikes, especially this time of year. But um, if you hear it happen, 
and the bird's lying there, if you gently pick up the bird, put him in a paper bag, fold it shut, and then put the bag in a, just a warm, quiet place, let the bird sit for half an hour, um, oftentimes that's all they need to recover, just a quiet place to rest. Um, if their injuries are more serious and they don't perk up, then you might need to take them in. But um, if it's just a little stunning, um, just giving them a safe place to recover where they're not vulnerable to predators or shock, just then, something um, quiet, they just to will, kind of recoup and yeah, kind of come back. Yeah, they'll often bounce back. Right? Oh, good. And if a cat gets hold of a bird? Cat bites are very serious, both for people and animals. Um, cat bites almost always become infected, so um, they need to be treated right away out of facility. Okay, so the best thing for that is to call the hotline. Right have away. Have them kind right. of address the situation right and see. Away, yeah. I guess on either you could probably call the hotline and see. Yeah what they should do about the situation. Um, the facility is clearly growing and they're getting, they, they would like to at least get something larger for them to do. So clearly people are bringing animals to them and, and knowing that it's there and trying to help them out. Um, I really liked how Lacey mentioned how when she first did work, you know, volunteer work, she wasn't that into it or just didn't really feel like it was her place until she kind of really dug deep into it. And then she felt like, you know, this is where she wanted to be, and, and she clearly does an amazing job and really likes what she does. She does. Um, it's an amazing place, and it's very, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a hospital. It's a complex operation, so uh, it does take a long time to get the training you need to really be um, efficient there, but um, it's a wonderful facility. So if they go in and they try to do the training for it, or whether they donate through supplies? Yeah, contact the Wildlife Care Center, ask what you can do. Um, if they need volunteers, of course they always need volunteers. Right. Um, there is a rather rigorous training process, as you can imagine, but um, they can use volunteers. They can also use supplies, and they always have a list of things that they need. Okay, and the facility itself, it, because it's obviously not open 24 hours, is there a certain time of year that they, that they need more volunteers than other times? I think they're pretty active all year. Um, and again, you need to contact them directly to see what it is they need Which at that time. Which one they're time. there, yeah. okay. Because they, they've dealt with so many different animals. I, mean, I was just, I, I honestly thought it was just the birds. I mean, when I had taken the bird there, that's all I assumed. I didn't realize that they did yeah, they'll, other they'll animals. Yeah, they'll help um, any native wildlife species. They will help if they can. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, the health and the welfare of all the animals that are around them and stuff, when they've got them in like solitude confinement, but for the most part, you can see things that go on there. Because when we were there, they had, you know, they had the window where they were working on the bird that we had brought in, right. that they went in right and worked on it right mm -hmm. away. And then they had the other ones that were in cages that couldn't be released back into the wild. Right. Um, you can, there are windows you can actually see into the exam facility, so you can watch, watch them working on animals. Um, most of the animals that are being kept there, they're in kennels or cages with covers over them so they don't become acclimated to people. They want them to stay right, wild. To, right, to um, where there are some to be. birds there that can't be released and they're, they're permanent education birds so you can go and see them at any time. And on, if a bird needs to like, they have to do flying, do they have areas where they can take them to that they can recoup? Because obviously where they're at is not, can't be large enough for some of the birds that they bring in. Cause right, they're, they're are, fairly large um, enclosures so they can move around a bit. They're not just stationary. Um, as far as like physical therapy for flying, I would imagine they would have to go out somewhere and do yeah, have on a long different lead, areas. Yeah. Um, I would, I personally would really encourage people to go down there, see the facility, understand it. Kind of uh, when you're there, you really get kind of a hands-on idea of what, you know, what they have to offer. There's nothing like being there in in the place versus exactly. someone, you know seeing it on television or talking right, about right. it. So um, I'm going to give the address to the facility again, which is 5151 Northwest Cornell Road, Portland, Oregon, 97210. And the hotline for the Wildlife Care Center is 503-292-0304. And it's the audubonportland.org is the website. Um, and I would just encourage people to go down there, see it, you know, touch it, just kind of get it, just to be there so you really understand of what it's like. And if you see Lacey, definitely give her, you know, just a really good job on the work that she does in that facility and what all she offers to the community. It's really, it's incredible. Um, and we would like to thank John Rigstraw for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And we'll see you next time.